Well, hello everyone. My name is Michael Dua. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Marion for putting all of this uh, clam bake together and uh, thank you for coming to my TED talk about traditional publishing, finding an agent, um, working with an agent, working with a publisher, uh, what all of that entails or might entail, and um, also a little bit about uh, the awards process in Canada, or particularly the granting process in Canada as it relates to uh, being an adjudicator for Canada Council or Ontario Arts Council or other arts agencies. So that's a fair amount of information and uh, I'm going to try and keep it to a half hour. This presentation is uh, pre-recorded, but I'll be available for any questions afterwards uh, live. So uh, I look forward to that because I, I enjoy answering questions. Um, so first of all, maybe a little bit about who am I? Uh, and why I'm uh, maybe qualified to talk about some of this stuff. Um, I've won uh, the Relit Award for Best Novel in Canada twice uh, for my first novel with Coach House Books and also for uh, my most recent novel with Anvil Press. Um, been in a, a number of other awards and things along the way. Uh, six published books now, I think. My next one is coming out. Uh, I Am Billy the Kid comes out in uh, April of 2022. And uh, there's uh, three more books contracted after that. So there's a, a, a good publishing schedule coming up. Um, some of the books. That was the first one. I'm guessing that these are all probably looking backwards on screen. But uh, that's all right. And that's the most recent. Um, so I wanted to say at the outset that what I'm talking about is traditional publishing uh, and not self-publishing. They're, they're two very, very distinct things. And so most of what I'm, uh, I know that we have probably uh, a lot of people who are interested in uh, going the traditional route. And I know there are a lot of people uh, interested in self-publishing. Some of what I'm about to say may be applicable to the self-publishing process, but it's it's geared specifically towards traditional publishing, just so you know it going in. Um, so working with an agent, finding an agent, um, it's it's difficult these days in Canada particularly, but I think globally from what I hear as well, it's difficult to get an agent. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is if you're if you're a writer starting out or if you're a writer uh, in your career and, and wondering if uh, an agent is something that you uh, could could benefit from. Undoubtedly, you could benefit from it, but do you need one? Is the question because as you're probably aware, the number of people who want to uh, traditionally publish is represented by this span, uh, and the number of people who uh, are fortunate enough to to get their foot in the door, that span narrows quite a bit. And the number of agents in this country who are available to clients narrows to about that span. So the the competition, as you're already well aware, if you're, if you're wanting to be, or if you are a writer, or if you are a published author, there's a lot of competition. Um, so it's hard to get an agent. Um, agents receive about, uh, well, my agent I know receives about 100 submissions a day. So that's a significant amount of material to wade through. Uh, so um, finding an agent can be difficult. I also wanted to say uh, a word of caution. If you're just starting out and if you're unaware of the process and how it works, um, because of this dynamic, the number of people wanting to get into this field and the number of agents that are actually uh, open to new clients, uh, increasingly, there have been a number of agents who are not agents uh, in the field and uh, aggressively advertising and trying to seek people out. Um, I'm not sure how they end up making money. I think they solicit money from the people who, uh, who want to work with an agent and take advantage of the situation that way. But just to be aware, if you're starting to look at the process of submitting uh, to agencies, um, they're not all created equal. So one thing I wanted to point out to you was the Writers Union of Canada uh, publishes a, um, a list online and you can find that fairly easily if you Google Writers Union of Canada agents and uh, they have a list of the 30 or so legitimate mainstream, good, reliable 
agencies in this country. Uh, and if you investigate each one of those places on their own sites, they'll tell you uh, what they're looking for. They'll tell you whether they're open to submissions or which of their agents are currently open to submissions. And you can find out what types of projects they'd be looking for. Um, back to the question of whether you need one. Probably not. If, if you are um, trying to access one of the big five publishers, uh, Penguin Random House, etc. I won't list them all, but the big multinational publishers that operate in Canada. Um, if you're trying to submit to them, then yes, you do need an agent because uh, they will, they are very unlikely to even look at your submission if it's not represented. So in that case, just in practical terms, you do need an agent. Um, but if you're looking to submit to uh, the, uh, quite the wider number of uh, mid-range or small press publishers in this country, um, then you don't need an agent. They're not going to uh, they're not going to reject your submission because it's not represented. And in fact, in many cases, they'd prefer that it not be represented by an agent just for practical purposes. Uh, they have no problem at all working with unrepresented manuscripts. So again, it depends on what you are looking for in your career and what your targets are as to whether you require an agent or not. Um, and that gets us to the question of whether you want one. And that, again, depends personally on what you expect from an agent process uh, and what you expect as a client. Uh, the other question is, does an agent want you? And that's that's a loaded question, but it's a, it's a real world question. Uh, it kind of depends on what you're writing, what your uh, intents for your literary career are. Um, agents are in the business of literature. Uh, they're interested in literature, but they're also, by pra in practical terms, they they uh, are business people. They they expect to make a profit. In fact, they have to make a profit. They have to keep the lights on. They have to feed the families. Uh, they're not looking to uh, do charity work. So, if you're writing something uh, that is not commercially viable, that's not necessarily something that's going to pique their interest. Uh, and that means that says nothing about. Uh, their integrity or their goals or your goals or who should write what or what type of project is more uh, viable than another. It's just a practical concern when you when you enter into publishing and uh, agency representation, that's a very different matter than actually writing the book. Uh, you're entering into a world of business and practicality and percentages and margins and all of that. Uh, so you have to be aware of that. Um, Query letters. Uh, that's generally what you want to start off with if you're submitting to an agency. You want to start with a query letter to let them know who you are and uh, and what you're looking for them to represent the project that you're talking about. So in most cases, you would want to start with a query letter. Certainly not a whole manuscript. Let's just assume for a moment that you're uh, you're pitching a novel to an agency. Um, they don't want the whole manuscript. Uh, they don't have time, as I said, with with, for example, 100 uh, submissions coming in a day, they, they have no time to read an entire manuscript. They want, if anything, a short sample so that they can judge the literary quality and the potential for sales. Um, so a query letter, and you could do, you could do a whole hour long presentation on, on how to put together a query letter, but essentially they want to know what the project is. They want to know uh, what form it is, whether it's a memoir, whether it's a novel, whether it's whatever it is. And they want a sample, uh, but not a very long sample. And you want to be, you, you don't necessarily have to take the first 10 to 20 pages. You can take it from anywhere in the novel. I wouldn't suggest chopping it up too much, like have two pages from here, two pages from here, two pages from there, because that's going to make it difficult to follow. And then you're using up a lot of that space with your connecting bits that explain how these things are connected. You want to make that sample as simple and digestible and easy but to read, but you also want to have it represent you in your best. Um, usually they want a publishing record and a, and a synopsis. So in addition to that sample, they want a brief synopsis of what the project is. And again, assuming that, that it's a novel, that's essentially a plot outline what happens in the book. I wouldn't go too deeply into other aspects of it because again, you're looking at someone who's got a what what what's called a slush pile, and uh, 
they're going through it as quickly and efficiently as possible so they don't have time to read extraneous material they want the essence of, of what represents this pitch and why this might be a, a good project for them to take on um, also important to only query agents that are open to your genre whatever form you're writing in uh, and that's pretty easily accessible on any agency website they will usually uh, have a list of the agents that work uh, there and they'll itemize what they're open to and what they're not open to. Um, you might want to mention, you might want to look at who uh, this agency already represents. Uh, again, you want to be very careful that you're uh, applying to an actual agency with actual agents and not some type of scam organization. So that's a good way to, to judge that. Take a look at who they already represent, not just so that you can be sure of the validity of the organization, but also you can have a, a good sense of whether you might be a fit for that agency or not based on other books, projects, or people that they represent and work with. Don't agree to anything unless you are offered a contract and then you want to be very careful about looking at that contract. Um, again, to not to state the obvious, but I know we're probably talking to a wide range of experience here. Um, agents never take money from an author. Money should always flow towards the author. Uh, there's not a lot of money there in the industry, but, but that's the direction that it should flow. It should never flow from the author to an agent or to a publisher. You're not paying a publisher to get published. The publisher is paying you with, uh, with an advance up front and then uh, royalties to follow and that's how it works. And the agent works on a commission based on a sale. So uh, you wouldn't, money would not be going towards the agent on your contract unless the agent actually sells your project. Um, and that's usually a 15% commission. And uh, we'll get more into that a bit later, perhaps. Uh, you can expect probably a three to a six month response time from most agencies in this country. As I said, there's a lot of submissions and uh, not, not a lot of agents to go around to read them. Um, many agents are currently closed to submissions and new clients right now, but there are still many that, uh, that are open. Um, good to keep in mind that uh, you, they're not doing you a favor by taking you on as an agent. This is a business proposition and it's, it's bound by a contract, a legal document, um, and that's important to keep in mind. So uh, just to review maybe a bit about why do you want an agent? If you do, the reasons might be uh, um, wanting to submit to the big five companies where it's really necessary to have an agent to do so. Uh, it does, it can, in some people's eyes, give you uh, a bit more of a sense of legitimacy. Certainly in the case of those publishers, it legitimizes you as someone who can be uh, submitting to them because you have agency representation. Um, quicker response times is something that's quite important. Uh, it doesn't matter who the publisher is, whether they're one of the multinationals, one of the mid-range, one of the small press. In general, they're going to pay more attention to something that comes in with a, a big name agent attached to it. Uh, and they're also going to respond more quickly in general. Uh, if you have a significant agent attached to a project and you're submitting it to a publisher, there's much less chance that it's going to sit with hundreds of other uh, envelopes on a desk somewhere in a back room until someone gets to it. It's probably going to be picked up and at least looked at uh, more efficiently. So it's saving you time in that sense, and that gives you more time to write. So that's an important consideration. Um, you don't have any contract worries if you have agency representation. You don't have to, I mean, if you don't want to be, you don't really even have to be involved very much in that process. You, your job then becomes putting your signature on, on the contract itself. Um, your agent is your professional who's contracted to make sure that that contract represents your best interests and that you're getting the best deal you can possibly get for your project and for your uh, whatever stage you are at in your career. Um, and speaking of advances with an agent, you're likely to get a more significant advance. Um, you're also likely to get better terms and that, that changes or escalates the number of successful projects that you have. Uh, and by successful, I mean, not just the number of sales that you would have to a publisher, but uh, the number of um, 
sales that those books end up generating at bookstores and online, etc. Uh, so an agent can negotiate uh, better terms for you as your career progresses. And that can be important. Uh, it helps you to build a career. And one of the important things about building a career is the more successful you are in terms of selling books to publishers and in turn those publishers selling books to readers, A, the most important thing is you have more readers and that's what we're all in this for, uh, but it also makes it significantly easier to sell the next project. Um, we talked about 15% uh, rate. I don't want to get too much into numbers because I'm noticing here that time is already flying away from us and we want to move on to the other topics. But uh, usually it would be 15% on all money earned in the life of the project. Um, there'd be a, and that percentage would apply to the, whatever advance you receive uh, up front. Um, it would apply to any sales for film rights or international rights. Um, and maybe just to conclude on that whole, whole thing, it's just that very important warning to someone who's just starting out uh, that money flows in traditional publishing toward the writer, never the other way around. No legitimate agent is ever going to ask you for any money up front. So um, let's work on a bit to with uh, move on a bit with uh, working with a publisher, editor, and designer. Uh, I, as I said before, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be available to answer them afterwards if I can. Uh, but also, I put some of this in the form of questions to myself because I work best that way. So one of the questions is, do I need to hire an editor? And the answer to that generally is no, it's not going to do any harm. I mean, the, prior to submitting your uh, manuscript to either an agent or to a publisher, should you hire an editor on your own? Um, generally, it's certainly not necessary to do that. What you do want to be certain of is that your manuscript is as clean and polished as it can possibly be. So I wouldn't submit it to either an agency or a publisher unless you have gone through a minimum of eight to 10 drafts. And I don't mean rewrites, I just mean going through it at least that number of times, looking at every single word and, and whether finding as many typographical mistakes or grammatical errors or anything else that you can find. Certainly not a bad idea if you have somebody in your network of friends or family who uh, is good at that type of thing, if they're willing to uh, give it a pass as well with an objective eye, often as, as you're well aware, if you're a writer, people can find things that uh, are quite glaring errors that you just don't see because you're very close to the project itself or you've seen those pages so many times that you just, you don't see them anymore clearly. Um, so that's certainly a good idea if you can do that. But uh, in terms of putting out money to hire good editors, professional editors, are very expensive, reasonably so, they should be. Uh, so that may not be an investment that is going to be in your best interest because if you are successful at submitting to an agent or a publisher, then that's going to be taken care of for you. That's another big advantage to traditional publishing. If you're, if you're successful in it, uh, in getting your project accepted, you don't have to put any money out for or find an editor or a designer or a cover designer or any of that, that'll be, that'll be taken care of. Um, so that also brings up many people starting out. I know it was true of myself and uh, I see it often people thinking that, uh, okay, here's my first novel. I finished it and I have these great ideas for a cover. So maybe I should include that when I'm submitting it to a publisher then they'll know that's already taken care of and they don't want to know that. They, they're not interested in your ideas for a cover. They may consult with you when you get to that process well down the road, but uh, that's just, that would be something that would be a bit of a trigger to a publisher looking at something that comes in with cover suggestions and that type of thing. They would realize that this person is, is way ahead of themselves and not necessarily in a good way and that they're not aware of the fact that that's a professional process that's going to happen down the line and may in fact not even involve uh, the author very much at that point. Um, how do I find the publisher? I would suggest that that process is very similar to the one that I outlined for finding an agent. Um, I know when I was starting out, it was a much more complicated thing because uh, there was no internet way back in those days. And uh, it's much easier now to find out uh, not just who the publishers are, but what they publish and uh, what you can expect from them who they work with, what types of projects they're interested in, that's all available. Uh, one place to start in terms of looking, if that's the stage that you're at, is uh, an organization, uh, canadianauthors.org. 
uh, has a list of Canadian publishers. And what I, when I suggest these lists, I'm suggesting them from various, uh, so, so from very specific uh, sites and organizations that are reliable because there are lots of lists of publishers and agents out there and some are more reliable than others and these two that I've suggested are, are ones that you can start at that you can rely on being uh, accurate in that they are listing only recognized professionals who are reliable and have a good long track record. Uh, so that one on CanadianAuthors.org lists 68 publishers currently in Canada. Um, so it can be hard these days to know who is a legitimate trade publisher and who isn't. Do your homework because there are a lot of uh, uh, places out there who would be more than willing to work with you and take your money to get your book published. Uh, and then get in a hole that, I'm, again, I'm not touching on self-publishing. There are a lot of legitimate uh, companies that will take care of that process for you as an author, if that's the route that you want to go. And there are also a lot of unscrupulous agents out there who will are much more interested in taking your money than in publishing your book. Uh, so you definitely want to do your homework and know who you're submitting to. When that letter comes in telling you that your long sweated over project has been accepted, you want to be able to rejoice in that, in the knowledge that it's been accepted by someone who is going to treat it well. Um, what to submit to a publisher. Uh, check all those sites for submission guidelines. All the publishers will let you know exactly what you should be submitting to them. Submit that and only that and submit nothing else. Follow those instructions scrupulously. Uh, publishers get more submissions than agents. So you can imagine with that number of publishers operating in the country, the, the number of uh, applications and submissions that they get it's much in your best interest to provide them only with what they've asked for and are looking for because they're not going to even look at anything else. They don't have the time to do it. Um, wanted to touch a bit on looking at whether they accept simultaneous submissions. So looking at uh, submitting to a publisher without an agent now, uh, you're wanting to know whether it's okay to send to one publisher, five publishers, 10 publishers, all 68 publishers at once. Uh, online, those, those publishers will indicate whether they're open to simultaneous submissions or not. Many of them will say it's fine to uh, submit to us and other uh, places too at the same time. Some will say they don't want that. But even those who do say simultaneous submissions are acceptable, they'll want you to inform them that, uh, okay, you're publisher A, but uh, I'm also submitting to publisher B, and they'll want to know if publisher B makes you an offer, then we'd like to be informed of that. Maybe they would want a counter offer. Or if you've already accepted something with publisher B, publisher A wants to know that so they don't have to go through the process of assessing your project because it's already been picked up by somebody else. Um, they'll usually want a one-page synopsis and a five to ten-page sample. We talked a little bit, little bit about what to choose in terms of including a sample for a, an agent. It's really the same thing for a publisher. Represent your work in the best possible way. So pick work that represents not only uh, your skill and talent as an author, but represents the core of the book. So it doesn't have to be the first 10 to 15 pages. It doesn't have to be the last. It doesn't it really, you just want to make sure you're representing writing that is accessible to the assessor in that it's not a whole bunch of pieces put together and they're trying to figure out where does this fit in and how does this all go together. They, they want the essence of the book. They want that elevator pitch that people always talk about in, in the, not necessarily in the synopsis, but in the query. And they want to know if they're spending the amount of time that it takes to look at the query letter and the synopsis and the sample once they've done that, they want to have a good full sense of what this project is. And publishers are not adverse to making money either. So it's similar as to uh, when an agent is assessing whether they want to take a project on. A publisher is, usually a publisher is all is slightly more interested in whether this is a good literary project and represents our publishing house well, but they also are interested in sales. So you're trying to walk that fine line in your application process as to without um, being ridiculous about it, subtly giving them an indication that not only is this a, a readable project, but uh, it, it's one that might generate sales. 
you don't want to tell them it's going to be a bestseller. You don't want to tell them it's going to sell lots of copies for them. They're the judges of that. You just want to present your work in, in such a way that someone can see that this could be a viable project for what is essentially a business. Um, they'll also want probably a publishing history or a brief biography. So just a couple of quick words on that. Publishing history, if you've got a publishing history uh, with magazines, with uh, online things, with anything, anything that you've legitimately published, they want to know about that. They don't want to know about things that are not legitimately published. So if you're writing um, articles for uh, you, you're a member of a club and they have a newsletter that that type of thing that that's not have it related to uh, projects that you've been involved with or you've created that have been uh, financially obtained by a legitimate uh, recognized professional organization. So that can include a whole wide range of things, but essentially they're looking at what have you sold and ideally what has then sold to other people. Um, again, they're in business and then they want to know that track record, if that track record exists. And if it doesn't exist, that's not a problem. It doesn't exist. That's not a prerequisite. But if that information is there, it's good that you present it. If you don't have that information to present because maybe you're just starting out or you haven't had that much publication yet, that's not something you have to hide. It's not something that's going to set off alarm bells for them. They don't want you to pretend that you have that. They want to know whether you have that or not, and not having it is not going to stand in the way. If they like the project, they're still going to offer on it. Um, remember again that they are swamped, so you want to make things easy for them. You don't want to make anything difficult or have them try to figure out anything when they're looking at your proposal. Uh, the, the, the clearer it is, the better it is for you. Um, six months to a year is what you can expect to wait from a, from a publisher. Uh, unless you get lucky and they happen to pick something up because it catches their eye and somebody reads it fairly quickly and they, they like it so much that they want to make it off, that does happen. Uh, but six months to a year is a guideline that you can expect to, in terms of hearing back from a publisher, um, which is a good reason to do simultaneous uh, submissions if uh, you're working with publishers that are open to that. Um, Let's say that you're fortunate enough to have your project uh, picked up by a publisher, whether it's through an agent or, or without representation. What can you expect from that point? You can generally expect that everything is going to be handled for you from there on. Um, you're, you're going to be involved in that process, but so for just in the nuts and bolts of it, the publisher is going to decide who the editor is. You'll work with the editor directly, but they'll either have someone in-house or they'll be hiring somebody independently who will work with you as the editor for your project. You won't, you can't say, I have this friend who, who, who I think would be a great, that's, that's not your role. Um, that process, depending on your project of editing can take uh, anywhere from a couple of months to uh, a couple of years, hypothetically. Uh, it is probably going to be a minimum of a year to a maximum of two to two and a half years between uh, a publisher picking up your project and then that book having a barcode and being in bookstores, et cetera. Um, and during that process, you're going to work with uh, an editor or maybe successive editors. Uh, you, you may be with a publisher that's going to have someone do the line edit, someone do the copy edit, someone do the substantive edit. There's gonna be different people working on those different aspects. Um, and sometimes it'll, it'll all be the same person. Um, yeah, I'm, did, I'm, I already mentioned that depending on your contract, you're not necessarily going to have any control over who those people are that are working on your book. Um, but if you're with one of those publishers on, on those reliable lists, you don't really have to worry about that. Those people are all going to be professionals and, uh, and you're not going to have any problems. Um, I have a question here written, whether you have an agent or do you need a lawyer, if you're offered a, a publishing contract and you are not represented by an agent, then it's incumbent on you to be the one in charge of looking at that contract. Then you can be fairly certain that it's, that it's reliable and dependable because it's coming from a legitimate publisher. But at the same time, if you're buying a, a $40,000, $50,000 car from a, a reliable car dealership, 
you can be fairly confident in things, but you're still going to look fairly carefully at all those details. So you want, there's no reason why you wouldn't do the same. Uh, you're very excited, if, particularly if this is your first publication with a major publisher, then you're very excited about that offer and you're very excited to accept it naturally, but you still want to uh, look very carefully at all the details. Cross the T's and dot the I's before you sign on the line. Um, if you have an agent, then that's much easier for you. If you don't have an agent, that's incumbent on, upon you to do that due diligence. Uh, so do you need to hire a lawyer to do that? You don't. It might not be a bad idea. Depends on your situation. Um, we talked about how long it might take for that project to uh, actually hit a bookstore or uh, online, etc. Um, just looking at the clock here, we're running a little short on time. So um, you want to make sure that that contract is going to spell out spell out everything, and it should spell out publication dates that are legally binding, so that the the the, uh, the Publisher will be giving an indication of, of when the editing process will will take place and wrap up and when you can expect the book to be uh, actually published. Um, there's a lot more information here. Maybe it'll come up uh, in the question process, but I'll very quickly try to get through some of this. Um, your percentage, people often starting in publishing wonder why is my percentage as an author so low? Why is somebody else out there in the shadows making so much more of a percentage on this book than I am? Because your percentage is probably around somewhere between 10 and 20%. The 20% is very optimistic. So if it's a first project, particularly, it's much closer to 10% of sales. Uh, this is after your um, advance, which is also probably not going to be huge when you're starting out. But uh, you would have to earn out that advance then before you see any royalties at all. And when you do start seeing royalties, if you start seeing royalties, if your advance does earn out, um, then it's going to be that that ballpark of percentage. And it's not that there is some shadowy figures out there making all this piles of money that's not coming to you as an author. It's the fact that nobody's making incredible amounts of money. Agencies depend on having a wide range of clients so that these small amounts of money that are coming in add up to something significant. It's not that they're taking this huge chunk out of the monies that would normally be coming to you. And it's the same thing for a publisher. It's not that they're making huge amounts of money by taking 80% of your sales for themselves. Remember that if you are pursuing traditional publishing as opposed to self-publishing, someone else is taking all of the risk. You've done all of the work of making that wonderful work, book that's getting published, but someone else is taking all of the financial risk of publishing it, promoting it, getting it, distributing it, these, the, I mean, producing it, editing it, cover design, book design, all of that. Um, none of that's being paid for by you. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Um, how much promotion wrapping up now the publishing process was a very very quick uh, run through the publishing process but uh, you can expect that as an author what, what even though you are traditionally publishing in this case uh, you can expect to take a, a lot of that promotional work on yourself your publisher will have a publicist assigned to your book but they're also going to be assigned to other books as well uh, everybody in this industry is overworked and if, if you're not willing to take on a lot of the promotion work yourself, you can't expect that your book is suddenly going to be magically noticed by people who uh, decide about awards or placement in bookstores or just all of that aspect that you have to, as an author, take responsibility for that because um, if you're not going to do it, who else is? Uh, you know, as I say, there'll be a publicist attached to your project, but but they are overworked and working with a whole bunch of other, you are only working with your book. So it's ideal if you can take that on. And that's not going to be something that's spelled out in your contract. It's not going to be something that publishers necessarily absolutely expect, but they'll certainly appreciate it. Um, and it will certainly be in your best interest. Um, how much promotion will you need to do yourself? That varies greatly depending on your own ability to do it and your interest in doing it. But in general, if you're not willing to take that on, you might be in the wrong business. Someone's got to promote your book and it's probably going to have to be you. Um, that kind of wraps that up. I did have a section here on what 
what a publisher does for you. And we went through a lot of what a publisher will do for you, but the most important aspect to me, and I think the most important aspect objectively is distribution. It's something that uh, I don't want to get too much into the differences between self-publishing and traditional publishing, mostly because I don't know a great deal about self-publishing, but I know a big part of self-publishing is the challenge of distribution. Um, as, as an author with a trade publication, you don't have to worry about any of that. Depending on your publisher, your, your book's going to be distributed internationally. Uh, it'll be available to, in libraries and bookstores, online and various venues. It'll, it'll just magically, for you as an author, magically appear on Amazon and Indigo and all of those websites, uh, as well as many others that you probably never, weren't even aware. It'll, it'll uh, be throughout North America and uh, we're not getting into uh, purchasing of uh, um, international rights or that type of thing in this talk, but uh, you'll be amazed uh, how quickly and how efficiently uh, your book will show up everywhere. Um, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to sell everywhere, but at least it is represented there. And uh, you didn't have to do anything to make that happen. To me, uh, one of the, the greatest, uh, one of the greatest advantages to being traditionally published is that all just happens. Uh, without any effort on your part. Um, and I, I can't stress enough too, that's not the same as independently putting it on Amazon. We're talking about a physical distribution and an electronic distribution that is fairly wide ranging and all encompassing. Uh, it's a very different animal and it's, you know, I'm assuming that if you're listening to this, you're interested in traditional publishing, this is one of the main reasons that you're interested in it or should be interested in it. It's one of the significant advantages that's available to you as an author through this route. Uh, so I haven't really touched much on, uh, on working with, uh, I've, I've done some work with Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council and different art, arts agencies in terms of uh, granting and submitting for grants and uh, working as an assessor to assess who gets grants and who doesn't. Um, so I'm looking at time here and I'm already way over time. So I'm just going to highlight and if people have questions, then we can follow up. But there's a lot of money available in this country through various grant organizations to people who are writing books, starting book projects, um, and, and all aspects of book publication as well. Uh, but you as an author, if you have a bit of a publication record uh, to qualify you for grant process, uh, you can, you can access as much as $25,000 at a time uh, for support grants for the creation of, of book projects. And that's a significant advantage to uh, being an author in Canada. So it's not something that you want to not look into or, or just avoid. I mean, it's personal choice as to whether you want to access that possibility that's there, but a lot of people don't even know that that possibility is there. So it's something you definitely want to look into and decide if that's something of interest to you at all. Uh, so we can, we can, I'm looking at the time and wrapping up here, but if people are interested in that, perhaps that could come up in the questions as well. There are millions of dollars available. Not, you, you can't get millions of dollars, but it, as, a, as a huge package, there's an awful lot of money out there available to uh, authors and people should know that. Um, so it could, it could easily have taken two hours to cover just that Canada Council, Ontario Arts Council information, but, uh, uh, I'm wrapping up now. So um, if you have any questions about that, let me know when it comes time for questions. And uh, otherwise, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thanks again to Marianne for putting this together. I think it's a great initiative. I look forward to uh, seeing the other people presenting um, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions for me about anything that I've talked about or anything else about uh, being an author in this wonderful country of ours where it's uh, it's a difficult field these days, but it's still ripe with possibilities and there's a lot that you can achieve if you have the, uh, the tenacity and the perseverance to uh, achieve what you want from your literary career. Uh, perseverance is the thing that I stress most, particularly with young writers, is what, what do I have to what do I have to have? What do I have to do to, to be a successful published author in this country in trade publication? 
you have to have a lot of perseverance. And that's not just about getting your first project out there. That's just the first step uh, to continue to have a successful, and by successful, I, I guess I just mean publishing, continue to publish. You have to have a lot of uh, tenacity and, and it's, it's a significant job. And if you have work uh, that you believe in and that you want to get out there so that other people can read it, it's incumbent on you to uh, do a lot of work to make sure that that happens. And uh, if you have any questions about how I can help you with that, let me know. Otherwise, good luck with everything and uh, I look forward to hearing the other people that are coming up. That was a riveting piece of cinema, Marion, don't you think? I, I was thinking as I was watching, I really should have included a couple of car chases, <laughs> maybe some explosions or something like that. And I also noticed at one point I mentioned that uh, that agents are swamped with envelopes. That sounds very much like an old man talking, because I remember when things used to actually arrive in envelopes, and I'm pretty sure my agent sends PDFs now. I don't think they're stuffing the envelopes anymore. So, anyway, I had to laugh at that. So if people are, if people do have questions, keep in mind that uh, even though I use phrases like envelopes, I am, I am aware of what actually happens in the publishing world. <laughs> Okay, thanks. That was that was great. Um, I there are a couple questions in the chat. I also see Lindsay has a question, so maybe we'll start with Lindsay and then get to the chat. Oh, thanks. Hi, Mike. Hi, um, Lindsay. How are you? Good. Thanks. Thanks for a great presentation. Very informative. You're uh, I I was kind of wa wondering about um, is it possible to change streams? Like, say, I, I feel like it might be more probable for me to get. Uh, published by a small local publisher first, and then if I'm successful with that, perhaps seeking an agent or, uh, you know, something like that. Do you think that's probable? Because I've also heard that if you publish with multiple different publishers, people are like, why doesn't anybody want to work for her with her for more than one project? So well, there's two aspects there. I'll take the second one first, then you might have to remind me what the first one was, but the second one in terms, of, I, I've published with multiple publishers and I had that concern early on. And I don't think publishers have that concern. It's it's very common in Canada that people will publish with, it, it's, it's more likely that you might stick with one publisher if you're lucky enough to sign with one of the large multinationals. But even then it's not a guarantee. The, the days uh, where someone would be with the same publisher for decades are pretty much gone and uh, publishers don't expect that. Um, if you have an agent, for example, and, and you've successfully published one, uh, one project with a publisher, your agent is going to send the next one on to other publishers as well, uh, unless you've signed a deal that, that um, is for say three books, but those deals don't really exist anymore either. Uh, you read about those things happening in the 60s and 70s and probably into the 2000s as well, but um, people in general don't sign multiple uh, book deals anymore. It happens, but it's very, very rare. And uh, sorry, Lindsay, I, I, as I said, I would, I forgot the first part of the question. Oh, it was about uh, changing streams. So say publishing with a small publisher, is it more likely then you would be able to find an agent as opposed to coming out? Uh, fresh with your first project? Not necessarily. Agents really are, it will certainly have the possibility of getting your submission to an agent read more quickly if you've got a significant publishing record or, or any kind of publishing record. But agents are really just looking for projects that they think will be financially critically successful that will represent their agency in a good fashion. So, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say that having published previously wouldn't necessarily help with that, but uh, let's say you've published three successful projects and you think, well, now I want to submit to an agent and you're submitting a project that just for whatever reason isn't very good. That doesn't mean an agent's going to pick it up because you've had three successful publications. They're really just looking at the project you're submitting. That's what's important to them. Awesome. Thanks so much to both you and to Marian. Thanks. Very welcome. Okay, great. So there's a question in the chat. Are councils, I guess these are the arts councils, more likely to award grants if you've received them previously? Uh, I, I'd harken back to what I just said about uh, agents as well. The, the short answer is no. Um, 
when I do my work for Canada Council and what I've done for the Ontario Council, uh, the process is that you'll start off with 180 manuscripts, say, and you read through all those over a couple of months. And those aren't full manuscripts. They're, I think they're 20, 25 page excerpts. Uh, and then at the end of that process, you're in a room for a full week, uh, five days, eight hours, nine hours a day with four to five other people assessing as a group what you've already assessed individually. And so really what you're looking at is, I, I don't, I, I think I can be confident in saying that any experiences that I've had there, it doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter what you published before or what you haven't published before. What matters is what's on the pages on the table. Uh, and I can be really confident in saying that because I've seen um, what I would say successful, if we define successful in this context as having published multiple titles. I've seen successful authors not get grants. I've seen people who have published nothing, who have no name recognition at all. And by nothing, I mean, haven't published anything about magazines, nowhere. And you've got people in that room jumping up and down with excitement over the manuscript and can't wait to, to grant it. Um, I, I'm someone who has multiple trade publications and I've been unsuccessful at getting grants and I've been successful at getting grants. Uh, since I started being an adjudicator, I don't really uh, apply for grants anymore, but I could reiterate what I said in the presentation is that there are a lot, I think there are a lot of young, I know for a fact there are a lot of young writers in Canada who have no idea that these funds are available. And uh, I, 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 I would like to see a change in that. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities being missed in that. Even, even though, uh, like anybody else, the councils are swamped with uh, submissions, uh, there's still a lot of people out there who don't know that that's possible. Okay, so uh, next question is, uh, Malfur, she says, awesome, thank you. As an idle author, I'm interested in knowing more about the grants. Why are they offered and for who? Um, you've covered that a little bit and then how to find them. And I write nonfiction at the moment. Okay, the, the, the grants exist just as much for nonfiction as they do for fiction. And um, I'll get in a minute about how to find them, but uh, <laughs> It's insane. Marianne, what was the first part of that question as opposed to how to find them? Because that's the easy part. Uh, why are they offered and for who? Okay, so they're offered for any writers and there's there's a, a wide, wide range of grants available for writers. Um, wide enough range that I, I don't even know how, like I couldn't iterate what they all are. The one that I'm most familiar with, the one that I'm adjudicator for is uh, Create and Explore, is the name of the grant, Create and Explore. That's Canada Council grant. And it's made available to authors who are developing projects. So you're, you're in the midst of a novel, for example, and you want funding to help you uh, with living expenses. There's, a, there's a, a range of expenses that are applicable. Uh, essentially, it's money to support you so that you can get your project finished. And in the case of nonfiction, you don't have to be in the middle of the project. You just have to have a, a query and a an overview of the project to submit. This is the book I would like to write. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's not uh, an easy matter to finish these grant proposals. They're quite complex, they're time demanding, um, and they're lengthy, uh, and they're comprehensive in terms of the author explaining what they're going to use the money for, uh, and in terms of what the project is, and how these things interrelate. There's a lot to, uh, to submitting a grant, it's, it's a significant undertaking of time, but you're talking about a grant as much as $25,000. So it's, it's reasonable to invest that amount of time. Um, in terms of finding them, uh, if you just look up the Canada Council site, all the information is there. And uh, I haven't been on the Ontario Arts Council site lately, but I'm sure it's all still there too. And I'm sure that other provinces have similar uh, arrangements, but, um, I think that answers the question that was asked. Great. Okay. And I see Angela has a question. This will probably be the last question. Okay. Hey, hey Mike. Hi, Angela. <clears throat> I just wondered if you had any thoughts on my situation. I'm just finishing polishing my first novel that I've worked on for three years. 
I've lived in the U.S. for many years, but I'm Canadian from New Brunswick. My novel is set in New Brunswick. So does it make sense to try to get a Canadian agent or a U.S. agent, or would it make much difference? Or do you have any thoughts? It doesn't make much practical difference in terms of, uh, of, I think you need to find an agent that you're comfortable with who's willing to take on the project. But um, I guess one question would be what your aim for that project is. Where do you want this novel to be published? So right. if you want it published in Canada, then you'd be best with a Canadian agent. If you want it published in the United States, you'd probably be best with an American agent. Um, Canadian agents in general, will they will pitch to American agents as well. It kind of depends on the project and where they see it fitting. Um, right. But in general, they're more likely to pitch to Canadian companies first and, and then maybe American. Uh, right. If they were successful at getting it uh, accepted by a Canadian publisher, then they'd be looking at selling international rights and moving on from there. Oh, yes, right, okay, thank you. Um, maybe I'd add one thing is that Canada is a smaller market, but that's also, and so there are fewer agents, but uh, as hard as it is to get an agent anywhere, if you're a Canadian, it might be easier for you to, to start in Canada. Yeah, it's that's pers right. It's personal choice and it depends on the project, you can certainly do either one. Right, thank you.